Brilliant. Cool. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. We're really excited to chat to you. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, are we the, uh, the umpteenth uh, interview for your day? Uh, we've had a few, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're a, you're a, you're a certainly a machine at this and, uh, yeah, we really appreciate your time. No problem. I look forward to it. Cool. cool man. Thank you. So you got it ah, man. sorted. <laughs> <laughs> this man's done this before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, come on boys, get going. <laughs> is, is the space above my head? Is it, is, am I framed halfway decently? You are you perfect. Framed well. Oh, no, if you just, the other, other way it was perfect. Yeah. Now you're perfect. That's, that's epic. Really great. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you. We are here with uh, Dr. Martini. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it too. So it's a mutual appreciation. Great stuff. You have an absolutely wonderful team of people that have helped us set this up. So we just want to say thanks to them too for all the, the kind emailing back and forth. Well, I, uh, I've delegated so much that I, I uh, appreciate all the people that are doing all those details. <laughs> it's great yeah they've been super kind like uh, it's been great to great to work with them and and like i said they, they probably help you a lot in getting your life organized but just before we actually kick off i uh, it's kind of like almost this chat is meant to happen because uh my dad's name is john martin and you know that's not too far from your name so <laughs> in some some way we've, we've been meant, meant to chat with you so it's, <laughs> it's cool to get this organized <laughs> Small world there. Exactly. I, I have a sister, a sister named Len, who married a gentleman whose last name was Martin. So she went from Len D. Martini to Len Martin. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so, John, um, we actually met uh, the first time. You, you probably won't remember, but um, you came to give a talk at the University of Johannesburg to the chiropractic students. Yes. Uh, some time ago, and I was, I think, I was probably third year back then. Uh, and it was one of those chats that basically instantly shifted something inside of me and my thinking and my beliefs. So I've always wanted just to say thanks for that. That was uh, really well, special. I love uh, speaking to the profession. I'm getting ready to do that in France in a couple of weeks. And oh, cool. I, I do that periodically and it's very inspiring. So I, when I have the opportunity to speak to students at the university or going into professional in the healing arts, that's always extra special. Yeah, thanks for that. So, uh, uh, so John, um, just to get an idea of what makes uh, the man that we see today, it's worth to sort of touch on uh, what the early days were like in, in Houston. Uh, things weren't always easy uh, for you, were they? Well, I think that uh, it's all relative, but I, I did have a bit of a challenge at the start. I, had, uh, I was born with my arm and leg turned inward, and... Uh, at about one and a half, I started having to wear braces on my arm and leg, I think till age four. And I was also going to a speech pathologist about that time. And um, I wasn't able to pronounce words and use my mouth properly. So I, was, I remember putting strings and buttons in my mouth as a little child and doing all these exercises to, <laughs> to, to work with my mouth. So I had um, a bit of challenge there. And then when I went into elementary school, my first grade teacher, when I was six going on seven, asked my parents to come to the school because no matter what I was doing, I wasn't able to read and wasn't getting meaning out of the words and couldn't spell them and couldn't pronounce them. And, and uh, so I had to wear a dunce cap hmm. when I was in first grade. Oh, and um, the teacher in front of my parents said, I, I'm afraid your son will never be able to read or write or communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. But I would put him into sports because when I got out of the braces at age four, I just ran everywhere. And so I became like this super, you know, runner because it seemed like, you know, every kid tries to find some place where they excel. And mine was running after getting out of the braces. I just wanted to run and keep my legs straight. And I, I just ran. So she suggested to my parents that he won't learn how to read, but he'll learn how to run. <laughs> I've been on the run ever since, I guess. <laughs> wow. What, what exactly is it? dance cap like is it something physical it's, or is she just it's a cone that you wear on your top of your head that goes up it's about so big it's kind of a cardboard looking thing and it sits on your head with a little strap underneath it you have to wear a dunce cap and it says dunce on it no ways yeah 
That's... Which, which Dutch meant somebody stupid, basically. Yeah, 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 exactly. I can't believe that. Yeah, I had, there was a guy named Daryl Dalrymple who was sitting next to me who also was challenged. And he and I had to sit and face the window until we decided we were going to learn how to read. But no matter what we did, it just didn't work. So wow, that, was, uh, but that was a little different than they do today. I mean, yeah. it's not the way they do today. But Tell so me about was. it. And, and what did so you... I've tur I turned my, tur my dunch cap into a, a cone, which I use in my depictions, and also a surfing a wave. So I've, And baseball, down. everything was a cone in my life, so I, I can't complain. <laughs> nice. And, and, and what did, did your folks, did they say anything or did they do anything, um, you know, to help you? Well, they didn't know what to do, and the teacher seemed to have knowledge about it. And they knew that I was interested in baseball, and so my dad did what he could to encourage me to go into baseball. And I actually did really well in baseball. And um, so I think when I was nine, 10, 11, and 12, and even 13, I had scouts from baseball, uh, professional baseball things watching me because I was really good in baseball. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was excelling there, just wasn't able to get through in school. And I had to go and talk to the smartest kids in the class to get information. You know, I'd ask them, what did you learn today? And I'd walk them home and chat with them. and. And I would get enough information to pass. And I even dated a girl named Martha Rose Scartosi, who was the smartest girl, and tried to walk her home and carry her books just to get information. So I was trying strategies to get through school, but it wasn't really fun to be stupid, but it was just what it was. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. <laughs> and 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 that's a, that was a technique that you sort of came up with was to surround yourself with the kids that were Well, I learned to ask questions. And I learned to, you know, find out what was inspiring to them. What, what did you get out of the class? What did you learn from that book? What did you, what was the, the you know, I, I, I used to go and do reviews and prepare them for their test so I could learn. But, but that, that's like super smart. How did you actually think of that? You know, as such a youngster to do that. I, I don't know if I thought about it. It became a survival strategy. Uh, interesting. Okay, cool. And then, because I, I noticed that the kids were when they were really smart and answered questions in school, the ones that could always answer the questions were the smartest. Um, you know, if I hung out with them, I figure I could get some information from them. the reason that one of them hung out with me, Jerry was because I was good in baseball. And so was he. So we <laughs> bonded on that. We became friends. And then I could, I could learn that way. The other one was more of an academic and I didn't relate to him, but he was friendly to me. So that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. And then basically, I think by the age of 14, you, you were pretty much living on the streets as well. So what happened there and how did you sort of deal with all that? <laughs> well, actually, I left, I left home at 13. Wow. And it's kind of a bizarre, funny thing. My, my dad and I were playing in the barn. We had a pool table in the barn. And we were playing a pool in the afternoon. And and I said, well, I need to go and get cleaned up because I'm going into town. We live 13 miles away from the town, so I have to hitchhike or ride a bicycle or whatever to get in there. And I, but he said, well, no, you've been out every night. You need to stay home tonight, son. I said, and I told him, no, I'm going into town. And we had a bit of a battle. And I didn't want to tell him that I, my best friend's parents were out of town. And there was a couple girls coming over to the house. And we had this thing planned, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to tell him that because then it would probably curtail it and I would look pretty stupid to the girls. So I, I didn't tell him that. So I just told him, well, I'm going into town. He said, well, if you go to town tonight, you don't come back. Went, oh, wow. Okay. He wasn't really upset. It wasn't like kicking me out of the house. It was just sort of like a, a disciplinarian thing because he wanted me at home. Huh. So I left and I packed up my bag and I, I became a street kid. And it wasn't because of any major argument, really. It wasn't major. It was just, he was just trying to be firm, trying to help me. And, um, but I started to live on the streets, got used to it. And then um, at 14, I left from Texas to um, go off to California. So I hitchhiked to California, which is a couple thousand miles, and then down into Mexico, which is another couple thousand miles south. And I went surfing because I ended up dropping out of school and dropping out of baseball when my parents moved to the country. And I, I went into surfing and I became a, an adamant at you know, an advocate for surfing big waves. I wanted to go to California and then I wanted to go to Hawaii. So at 15, I went to Hawaii and lived on the North Shore till I was 18. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Courageous. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I loved, I loved sports because 
And I, there was a guy that was living in a tent there that used to read to me. And I used to ask him to read to me. And I'm still friends with him. No way. Uh, he, was telling, he was telling my daughter in California last year, he said, you know, your dad used to ask me to read to him. It seemed so bizarre. I used to throw the magazine at him and say, well, you can read it. But he said, no, the way you read it, I told him, I said, the way you read it, it's inspiring to me. I like hearing it. And he, just because I couldn't read it. I could look at the pictures, <laughs> but the surf magazines and girl magazines, about all I could look at. And, <laughs> the, uh, and uh, But I couldn't read it. The words didn't make sense. So he used to read to me. And I got in the habit of having other people read for me. She was, yeah, things have certainly changed since then, haven't they? And um, you've read a lot of books. But anyway, so... <laughs> we, you talk about in life, like there's always like a positive and a negative to every situation. And when you were 17, uh, you nearly died. Um, but you see this as a blessing in disguise, don't you? Well, what was happening, I was, uh, I guess you could say expanding my consciousness through natural means. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> there, was, there was a plant that grew there that had strychnine cyanide analogs in it. And um, it started accumulating. And at first, because I was surfing 11 hours a day on typical, 9 to 11 hours a day. Wow. And so everybody said, well, you know, when you're having spasms, because I started getting spasms to my toes, Charlie horses in my toes and fingers. Wow. And I thought, well, it's probably because I'm a leak, leaking electrolytes out and potassium. So I started eating bananas and nothing was helping. But it turned out that it was the strychnine was affecting my neuromuscular system. And um, it eventually stopped my diaphragm. Oh. It was this very scary moment when you can't move your diaphragm, you can't breathe. And uh, I ended up being unconscious for three days. And I don't even know how I got back to my tent. I was at a supermarket when I fell unconscious in the parking lot. But I ended up in my tent. And luckily, a lady found me in my tent and took me to a health food store when I recovered. Um, and and uh, that's where I learned about going to a little class where Paul Bragg was. And it was the, the, the night that I met Paul Bragg that my life changed. And, mm. and do what I'm doing today came about that night. Wow. What exactly and, happened? What, what, and who is Paul? Well, sorry. He, he, uh, he spoke, this gentleman, this Paul Bragg, Paul C. Bragg, the guy that did Bragg's amino acids and Bragg's health foods and things. Mm. And he spoke at the Sunset Recreation Hall in the North Shore of Oahu for about an hour, not even an hour. And, and um, it was just so inspiring. What he said was just so inspiring. And, and that was the first night that I thought after hearing him that maybe I could overcome my learning problems and maybe I could learn to read and become intelligent. I never thought I was going to be an intelligent kid. I mean, surfing, I was good sports. I was good, but not academic kind of stuff. And I really didn't want to be stupid. I kind of wanted to be able to read like everybody else. I kind of want to do all that, but it just didn't seem to work and it was too much effort. So I, I, uh, that night I made a kind of a decision. I saw a vision of what I wanted to do, which is painted in my office today, uh, the vision. Hmm. Um, I made a goal to um, overcome my learning problems. Hmm. It was a slow step-by-step -step process that, that helped me. I mean, it was a slow process, but once I got the hang of it and I never stopped. <laughs> I mean, I'm, today I'm writing a textbook on, uh, on helioseismology and the cosmology of the sun. So I'm, and in, in, in depth. So, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm researching now things that I would not have imagined in those days. Wow. It just always, it just always blows our minds that literally something you hear from someone that took the effort to go and do that can change your life. Literally. It's, it's just very inspiring to, to behold well, what can happen. That was, that was the night that I said to myself someday when I'm, his age, I want to find a young man to pass the torch to. In the meantime, I'm going to practice. Hmm. I wanted to do what he did. I wanted to inspire other people to do what they would love to do in life, hmm. which is why I do what I do pretty well every day. Yeah. I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing than what I'm doing. So this is what I do. Awesome. Amazing. Really amazing story. And, and talking about just, you know, coming bloody full circle is you actually ended up magna cum laude when you finished your studies as a chiropractor. You, you, you came a massively long way. Obviously, you just mentioned all these other things you're busy with. Was, it, was that like a, a, good, a big moment for you? Well, I can't say the, that I had done well in, in school prior to professional school and then in professional school. So it wasn't like a, 
I was grateful for that. It wasn't mm -hmm. like the super amazing thing. I'm very grateful because I knew I had one of the top grades. I had a desire to learn and everybody had that same desire. I mean, whatever they requested in school, I always multiplied it times 10. So if you have a textbook to read, I'd read 10 of them at the minimum. Hmm. And I always, uh, the, the clinical requirements, I multiplied times 10. I, I didn't want to be average. I wanted to excel. Hmm. And so I, uh, so when I got that, I wasn't overly surprised because of the work I'd put into it. But um, I'm very grateful for that because I don't know if anybody really asks you when you're in practice whether or not, you know, were you at the top of the class or bottom of the class? I don't think they ever ask you that. <laughs> it didn't really matter to anybody else, but it, it was a, it was a sign that I made the effort. And uh, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah. But I, I uh, see what happened is when I went, I left Hawaii, I flew back to Los Angeles. I hitchhiked back to Texas. Uh, and right when I, before I got to my parents' house, my dad and my sister drove by and didn't recognize me. No and way. Long hair, long hair. They didn't even know who I was. <laughs> they went driving right past me. And I waved at him. They thought I was kind of a weird character on the street there. I get home and my mom and dad, uh, they welcome me home and they said, you know, uh, why don't you take a GED while you're here, which is a high school equivalency exam. And I thought, well, I got nothing to lose. If I pass it, great. If I got a, I got a high school degree, if I don't, no big deal. I did it and I guessed and I passed with the help of a little affirmation that Paul Bryant gave me that I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom. He told me to say that every single day. I never missed a day. I've never missed a day in 46 and a half years. No ways. And then uh, I passed that. I passed a college entrance exam by guessing, purely guessing. It was, I really felt that there was some sort of higher power or something happening here. <laughs> and then when I first took my first college exam uh, from, a, from a class, um, I failed. I got a 27. And I needed 72 to pass. I got a 27. Uh -huh. I really was depressed. And I really was just crying in my car and I was driving home and I was crying and I thought, man, this whole thing's a delusion. I'm not going to have what it takes. And I could hear my first grade teacher talking to me. Mm. I'll never read, write, communicate, and the amount of thing that would go very far in life. I came home and I curled up in a fetal position under this Bible stand in my living room of my parents' house. And my mom came home from shopping and she said, what's wrong, son? What happened? I told her that I blew the test. I guess I don't have what it takes. I guess I'll never be able to do this. And she didn't know what to say. She just paused for a moment. And then she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, son, whether you become a great teacher, healer, and philosopher and travel the world like you dream, whether you ride giant waves on the North Shore that you've done, or whether you return and panhandle on the streets as a bum, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what. Hmm. And in that moment of unconditional love, in that moment of certainty and presence and gratitude, uh, my hand went into a fist. I closed my eyes and I saw the vision of the night that I was with Paul Bragg of me speaking in front of a million people. And uh, I said to myself, I'm going to master this thing called reading and studying and learning and teaching and healing and philosophy. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel at a distance and pay whatever price to give my service of love. I'm not going to let any human being on the face of the earth stop me, not even myself. And I made this commitment to myself. There was a no turning back moment. And I gave up and I gave, up, gave a hug to my mom and I went into my room and I got a dictionary out and I started in the very beginning of it and I started memorizing 30 words a day. And my mom tested me on this pronunciation, spelling, application, meaning, and, and uh, using it in a sentence. And I really, really mastered 30 words a day. So at the end of 365 days, you know, you've, you've, you've grown your vocabulary. Wow. And, and, I, and I just kept doing that. And for the next couple of years, I basically memorized much of that book. And um, my, my vocabulary grew, and I started passing school, and then I started excelling, and I started reading encyclopedias. I read eight complete sets of encyclopedias and read everything I could get my hands on hours a day. When I was about to turn 19, my mom said, what do you want for your birthday and for Christmas? I was born on Thanksgiving Day, and she said, what do you want? And I said, I want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings that humanity has ever created from around the world, from the greatest minds. She looked at me, she, you don't need a teacher? And I said, no, mom, I want the greatest teachings on earth. Well, she called a brother who was a, my uncle, a professor at MIT in physics and chemistry, and he sent a giant, two giant six by six foot by six foot wooden crates with thousands of books in it no down to our house on a flatbed truck. And they lowered it on the ground and I took a crowbar and opened up and filled my room with books and just sat for 18 to 20 hours a day reading. The only time I wasn't reading there, I was reading on the way to school and reading on the way back. And I just lived in books and 
I never stopped that. And I'm still reading every day. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. just incredible. Wow. <laughs> um, your, all your, your folks and your mom sound like incredible people. And it's like, it's so that, that having their backing and their love is so important. And it sounds like it really changed things for you. Um, one thing which is super interesting and you've said about it, you know, you, 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 you wanted to do things 10 times. You became a voracious reader. How, how do you get through so many books? I mean, it's incredible. And like, what else inspired you to, to read so many books? I mean, you know, like, I think there's a story about you saying you can only read like normal people can only read maybe like one book a month. And if you look at your whole life, that's not actually that many. Um, so, so yeah, how do you speed read and, and you know, what other things are there behind you wanting to consume all this information? Well, I guess when you didn't think you ever would, and all of a sudden you realize you can, it's, it's inspiring. And every day I asked what worked, what didn't work. And I documented what was making me read faster or slower. I noticed if I sat in the sunny glare, I would go slower and I tend to fade out a bit. If I drank water, cool water, if I set up straight, if I had the book at an angle, um, I, I just started documenting what worked and what didn't work and created what was really a, a speed reading class. People started asking me to teach it after all. I never took a class in it. I just wanted to know what worked for me. And um, I started reading, you know, more and more. And I, I didn't, I, I'm the kind of guy that if I was to go to the bathroom, I would read 10 pages on the way to the bathroom, sit, read another 20 pages, and then walk back another 10 pages. I'd go to the restaurant, I'd walk and read 10, 20 pages, sit and wait for my food, read, you know, so many pages and come back. I used every minute of the day for learning. And I had books always within my grasp uh, when I was in professional school. And I got up at two in the morning did meditation and yoga for 30 minutes, and then uh, started speed reading. By the time I was 23, 24, I was uh, knocking out four to seven books in the morning between 2.30 in the morning till 6.30. No About a book an hour, a book every 45 minutes. And then I would go jogging, come back in, shower, go to school until the afternoon, go to clinic, and then come back at seven at night and teach whatever the books that I'd read. And I started having students that didn't really care what I was talking about, they just would come to class every night. And that's how I paid. I charged $20 for those sessions and, and I paid for school that way. I made about $100,000 a year when I was 23, 24, teaching classes every night. And uh, that way I could buy books because I was buying, buying between 40 and 70 books a week. And uh, was, I was just reading and learning and, and teaching. And I, I never really stopped that except now I'm teaching more and my reading has dropped and it's now a lot online. So. I don't have to buy all the books as much now. And people give me books all the time. <laughs> but uh, I carry a bag of books with me. I'm always carrying uh, bags of books. Oh, nice. And, uh, they're, they're back here. And in my bags, I've carried them. So I'm, I'm reading. Uh, it's my life. So wow. my and responsibility as a teacher yeah. to learn. So. Yeah, yeah. And how do you memorize it? Like, Because uh, reading is, you know, that's one part of it. But actually remembering is another part. Well, you retain information, uh, it goes, your retention goes skyrocketing if you give out what you received as close as possible in time. So in other words, if I learn something and I give it out within just hours, I retain it. Mm. So it's about, it's, about, it's about recycling it as fast as possible and also linking the information, whatever you read, to what you value most. So mine is the aware, awareness, you know, maximizing human awareness and potential and the evolution of human consciousness. So every topic even including helioseismology and solar studies, <laughs> is related to the evolution of human consciousness. I'm actually putting a book together on the relationship between nuclear transformation and human conscious evolution. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very strong correlation of why we're stars in the making in the future mm -hmm. and uh, how we're involved in that. So this is all about the evolution of, of consciousness, really. It's a pan-psychic conscious awareness uh, model on cosmology. So... So I'm studying anything and everything in any field, 299 disciplines now, all related to human evolution and consciousness. And I retain it because it's linked to what is most inspiring in my life. Hmm. And I give it out as soon as possible to as many people as I can. Wow. So the, so the teaching 
is a, almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way because it actually makes you better at retaining the That's stuff it. that you're learning. So it's this, it's this positive cycle. Well, I learned that if I, if I uh, you have to have equity and equanimity. Equity means that you're, you can't exaggerate yourself over others. You can't minimize yourself over others. You've got to be able to see that we're all reflections of each other. And so the best way to do it is to share what inspires others that also inspires you. So that's why I've accumulated students around the world to find the people that would love to learn what I have to share and share that so I can learn for me and also mm. pass that torch to them, which is a fulfillment of what my dream was when I was 17, 18. Hmm. <laughs> and you've actually amassed something like more than 29,000 books that you've read. 30,250 now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that really is quite incredible. So, um, but yeah, I understand when you, when you say how you were doing it, it's, it makes so much sense, but um, still cr quite incredible. So during this, this sort of quest for knowledge, you did a lot of experimenting and testing and, and a lot of these kinds of things as well. Um, one, uh, one was that you did uh, an experiment with affirmations and your emotions over a two year period. Can, I found that quite interesting. Can you just explain what you did there? Well, what I did is I, I, in, at age 18, I got um, given a set of books by my parents, uh, by Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking. And I read that and I thought, oh, okay. I didn't know anything about it. And I thought I need to be more positive. So as I did that, I noticed that no matter what I tried to do, I didn't always stay positive. I had positive and negative. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I must be not learning this very well. It doesn't seem to be sticking. And so I then started reading more books on the positive mental attitude thing. And I started mentoring by going to, to seminars by these leaders of the positive mental attitude. And then I one by one met them all and then found out that they weren't all positive. And I started thinking, well, wait a minute now. They're not positive at all times. I'm not positive at all times. Is this really obtainable? Or is this just some sort of pipe dream that uh, you're going to be one-sided all the time? In physics, there's an equation. In mathematics, there's an equation. In chemistry, there's an equation. Everything's showing a balance, but somehow over here in psychology, it's supposed to be one-sided. It didn't make any sense. And uh, it seemed like an opium of the masses to me. So I, um, I started doing an experiment where I, I took 300 of the best-selling positive mental attitude books, and I circled every positive word in them neurotically. I'd already underlined them anyway, but anywhere I saw a positive <laughs> word, I circled it, I extracted it, I put it on a three-by-five index card, and I stored them alphabetically into these boxes because I bought them by the thousands. I took notes on index cards so I could sort them and always have order to them and not just have notepads, which are very inefficient. And um, so what happened was I, I accumulated 2,000 of the most positive words in the English language. And then I meditated on each word and I thought of an affirmation or quotation for each. And I published a book called 2,000 Quotes to the Wise, a Day-by-Day -day Guide to Inspirational Living. You can still look online right now and you can see it's still out there. I sold like probably 50,000 copies. And, uh, but it's, it's the most positive words with the most positive affirmation quotations used. They were used in subliminal tapes in the 80s in America. And I then started to take those words, those affirmations, and they were, I divided by 365 days, which led to five to six quotations per day. And then I started to recite them 108 times a day for each of them. So I picked a day, I'd take five or six quotes, recite all five or six quotes 108 times a day minimum, Sometimes I do over a thousand. And then I'd monitor how I felt four times a day at, at seven, 11, three, and seven. <laughs> of how I uh, was doing is spiritually, mentally, career, financial, family, social, and physical areas of my life to find out what positive statements are doing to my behavior. And at the end of two years, 24 months of doing this four times a day, um, every day for, four, for two years, I then summarized all the, the, the results, and, and I monitored it by having um, a, a plus three to a zero to a minus three. If I was a plus three, I was inspired. A minus three, I was desperate. Mentally, I was sharp or dull. A vocation, I was successful or failure. Um, financially, I felt abundant or lack. Uh, socially, or a relationship, I felt close and intimate or distant. Socially, extroverted or introverted. And physically, I felt vital or, you know, drained or whatever. And I monitored these things on a plus three to minus three basis to see the fluctuations throughout the day and throughout the week and month for the two years. And then I summarized all the results 
um, at the end and they came out zero. And I was just, I was blown away because I realized that all my ups had downs and all my downs had ups and they were, sometimes I go up, 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 down, up, up, down, 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 up, down, up, down, down, up, 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 down, down, up, down, down, down. I was fluctuating like this and the net result was zero. And then I realized that I just spent 12 years of my life, 10 years, this started at age 28 to 30, I did this. 12 years of my life is trying to be a one-sided person. I was trying to get rid of half of myself. And a person doesn't need to get rid of half of themselves to love themselves. I'm trying to be one-sided, which is creating a bipolar response. I was most volatile during this period. And I realized that that's it. I'm done with that. And I realized that uh, the, the mind has both sides for a reason. So I wanted to know what's the purpose of the negativity. And I realized that unrealistic expectations, uh, delusions, and fantasies that we strive for that are one-sided are the source of our negative side. And then I realized it's not a bad thing. It's, it's a biological necessary thing for people that are addicted to fantasies, trying to avoid pain, seek pleasure. In Buddhism, they said that the desire for that which is unobtainable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is a source of human suffering. And boy, that was the, I found that to be true. People are striving for fantasies and being addicted to those things and not grounded in set of real objectives, which mean balanced thinking. So yeah, I did that experiment and that was a, a breakthrough, uh, a turning point in my teachings because I realized now a hard science can be made out of psychology instead of a pseudoscience. That's so powerful. Wow. Talk about uh, taking big data to, you know, like you started that basically early without it <laughs> even becoming a thing. Um, so I just want to ask, how big is your library at home? It's got to be massive. Well, actually now I, I sold um, 11,000 of my books to one student, another 8,000 to another, 4,000 to another. Um, so there's, there's, probably another eight or so thousand sitting in their office. I've got some on the ship and I travel with them and I, I leave them places because I just can't, they're just too hard to carry. Once I've read them, I don't, I leave them, give them to other people. But um, I used to carry them, but I just ran out of space and I didn't want to just keep buying and filling. It's a very poor use of money just to store books that are old, outdated. So I, um, I just started selling them to other people that wanted the information and they wanted to read my underlined because I made marks and underlying and notes all through them. They wanted to read those. So probably they'd be valuable. There's probably a, a value somewhere down the line in the future, but I'm just interested in the information. That's all. And, and have you switched over to like audio books or are you still like more a physical kind of? I, I still, I listen to some audio books here and there, but I, um, I'm not against that. I listen to YouTubes and I mean, I'm learning whatever way I can, but I still love, um, reading, you know, books, and I still love reading online. I read a vast amount online now. I mean, there's so much online that it, I can, I've spent most of the last, uh, I mean, I'm doing podcasts. I've done about seven podcasts in the last couple of days. And I, I uh, between that, I'm, I'm online and I'm researching and typing and, and putting manuals together and stuff for this text. So I'm constantly reading. I mean, I, it's part of my life. Yeah, fascinating. It, do, do you have any downtime like or any strategies that you use for downtime? I don't allow diet time. I, I don't have any interest for downtime. I, I have an interest on either researching, writing, travel, or teaching. But downtime, I may eat. But when I eat, I, I, I brought something down to read while I'm eating. Hmm. If I'm socializing and talking to people, I'll do that. But it's got to be meaningful. I'm not just interested in socializing. I don't drink. You know, I don't, so I don't sit and socialize and drink and go to parties and stuff like that. That's not my thing. Uh, I just, I'd rather use my time. It's my life. It goes by too quick to uh, not use it as meaningfully as I can. And I, I love teaching and researching. So that's what I do. Yeah. But you People do, say, what do you do to chill out? I go, chill out from what? You, I, I don't feel stressed. <laughs> my blood pressure, it always blows the, the dentist's mind. I go to the dentist and I go, you're, I can't find your blood pressure. I said, I know you keep having it too high. Bring it down. <laughs> 96 over 56 or 98 over 58. That's typical blood pressure. Nice. But you do meditate and you mentioned yoga. So I presume that's a little bit of um, a valuable thing for you as well. Yeah, I still do a little bit. Uh, I do meditation quite often. I mean, that's, that's a pretty well daily thing, but I don't do the Hatha yoga like I used to as frequently. Uh, and my schedule is pretty intense with speaking mm. now, but I do it. I mean, I like last night I did uh, this morning. I haven't, it's not like this I, daily ritual like it was in my teens, 20s, and yeah. even into my 30s. I taught yoga until I was 39. Oh, so cool. 
That's really cool. So, and, and one thing that you spoke about just now is you, you learned 30 new words a day uh, in the dictionary. And one thing that you actually identified was uh, 4,628 different behaviors in the dictionary. So maybe you can just explain what those are exactly. Well, I found out that um, I noticed that I would react to people either through admiration or despise attraction or repulsion to people. And I would be hooked and I'd have buttons on people, people I would want to avoid and people I'd want to go and interact with. And I asked why, why am I avoiding this person? And why am I attracted to this person? What's, what specifically is it? And I realized that anything that I'm attracted to, I'm too humble to admit that I have it inside me, but I actually have it, but I'm too, too humble to admit I have it. And then I, when I resented somebody, I was too proud to admit I had what I saw in them. And the reason being is I felt ashamed of the trait and they were reminding me of it. I didn't want to be around them because it reminded me of what I was judging in myself. Or I wanted to be around them because it was reminding me of what I was infatuated with myself about. And so I started realizing that I'm being hooked by people's behavior. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with my perception of me relative to them. And so instead of me waiting for people to push my buttons and I'm an automaton reacting to people on the outside, I just decided to preemptively strike that and go into the dictionary and go through that big Oxford dictionary and go through and circle every possible human behavioral trait. And then what I did is I looked at that trait and I asked who in the world is the most extreme example of that trait that I know. And I put their initial out to the side. And then I would ask, I would go to a moment where and when I display or demonstrate that behavior and I'd keep identifying when and where I displayed that behavior until I was certain that quantitatively and qualitatively what I saw in them, I had in me to the same degree. And then I noticed that if I met that person, it had no impact. I just felt love for them. I didn't have an admiration or despise. I just felt love for them. Hmm. And that it cleared out a lot of emotional baggage. It's noise in the brain. It distracts you. And that's the source of all the noise when you're doing meditation that you have to get through in order to get to a state of poise. So I realized that by doing that exercise and owning the traits of all the behaviors, uh, it kept me being more active, proactive, not reactive, and have more mind clear instead of noise. And that was what's the effort. And I did that over quite a, quite a period uh, going through that. Uh, and I found 4,628 traits in there that are human behavioral traits. Hmm. That's so interesting. <laughs> So, uh, John, after obviously years of focus, studying and learning, um, you've amassed quite a massive amount of knowledge around b human behavior and wealth and, and other things, um, p which people from all around the world now, you know, come to learn from and, and hear you speak and talk and, and read your, your writings. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the Demartini method and also um, what the breakthrough experience is like? Well, the Breakthrough Experience is a program that I've been doing over 30 years now. I've done it 1,060 something times. Um, there's been tens of thousands of people that have attended that. And it's my attempt to do what Paul Bragg did for me, to help people break through whatever is in their way and to turn it on the way, to transform any emotions they may have that's baggage into fuel, to be able to get clear about what their mission is, what their highest value is, I teach them the Demartini method, which is how to dissolve any of the uh, distractions so you really have a clear mind. And just helping people do something extraordinary with their life. Now, the Demartini method is a methodical series of questions that help you discover the hidden order in your apparent chaos in life. So anything that you have an emotion about that you're not grateful and feeling tears of gratitude and love for, it transforms whatever you perceive it to be into something you're grateful and have love for. And so once you have gratitude and love, you're fueled. And until then, you're emotionally distracted. Anything we infatuate with it occupies space and time in our mind. And anything we resent occupies space and time in our mind. Anything we love, our mind is clear. So all that noise is cleared by, by a perfectly poised mind. And the Demartini method is a science that is an absolute reproducible science. It works every time, if you follow it to the letter, to clear the noise. So you can do meditation, but when you get out of the meditation, the noise is gonna be there again. This dissolves the noise, so you have an instant meditation at the end of the process. And uh, it's being studied at Keio University in Japan right now for grief, dissolving grief and depression and panic attacks and all kinds of stuff. It's got a wide application, 
And it, it is a science that I've been working on since I was 18, since I studied Paul Dirac's work on particle and nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. I put a, a, an analog together on human psychology. And um, it's really, really an amazing piece of work that uh, I'm very grateful that I've been able to develop because it's served a lot of people and it serves anybody that uses it. Wow. I can imagine that that's, like you said, that's what inspires you. That's what gives you energy uh, every single day. Just seeing these changes in people, it's rather amazing. The most amazing thing that I get to do usually occurs on Saturday night at the Breakthrough Experience when I get to watch somebody transform their perceptions uh, into thank yous. I mean, there's people come in there with uh, plateaus in business, uh, plateaus in economic development, plateaus in relationship issues. They're wanting to blame stories of people, their mom and their dad or their family or their, their, their spouse or who knows what, social issues. Whatever the people come in there with, if they've got an emotional baggage about, uh, we methodically go through there. And when they're done, there's just a tear of gratitude. There's absolutely nothing that was out of order. It it's helps people discover the hidden order, the impotent order in their apparent chaos. And that is worth a lot. I mean, I've people of all different, it, it helps resolve health problems that's from d distress, uh, financial problems, business. I mean, every one of the seven areas of life are impacted by it. In fact, it's the most efficient tool that I've been able to build that allows a person to empower all seven areas of their life at the same time. Hmm. It's a very powerful tool. I, I, I could probably go a couple hours on that right here yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and elaborate on that. But um, when the brain is in the executive center and it has self-governance and the nerve fibers from there with glutamate and GABA are, are monitoring, monitoring and, and dampening the volatilities of instinct and impulses from the amygdala, which is the desire center, you have an executive function. And that's when you have a clear, lucid vision. That's when you have a strategic plan on how to execute and, and get the, the job done. And that's how you have self-governance and self-mastery. I'm interested in self-mastery. I'm interested in helping people master all areas of their life. And this tool is a very powerful tool. It's the most powerful tool I've seen that allows people to do that. So I'm, I'm very inspired to work on it. I've been working on it a long time. Yeah, for sure. What, what, what's the, you know, you're inspired to see people have self-mastery. Just, just briefly, like, why? What is the real deeper, bigger picture of that? Like, why is it important to see other people find well, it, Nothing really, you know, profound. In, in, when I was 20, I met Zig Ziglar and a guy named Ed Tullison. And um, Ed Tullison traveled all over the world, living in the, the penthouses of the fine hotels. Um, and he did programs. And I modeled part of my life after that because I live full time traveling either on my ship or while I'm in hotels. I travel full time. I don't. You don't live in one place. I'm constantly traveling around the world. World is home. And, um, and Zig Ziglar, both of them said that, you know, if you want to help other people get what they want to get in life, they help you get what you want to get in life. It's a, it's a fair exchange. You have to serve people and to get rewards. So I'm not altruistic and I'm just doing it for the sake of other people. Mm -hmm. I'm not narcissistic. I'm not doing it for just me. I found that you have to have equity between those two. And if I help other people master lives, I get to master mine. And I'd love to do that for me. And it exemplifies and inspires them. And it works in a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't have a one-sided reason for doing it. It's mm -hmm. not altruistic. It's not like I want to sacrifice for others or sacrifice them for me. I just want to do what I love doing and help other people who are inspired to do that, do the same. And it's not for everybody. It's for people who want to go and master their life. Mm -hmm. And most people say they do, but not everybody really has the desire to do that. It's just like everybody says, I want to be financially independent, but less than 1% actually do. They just want to say that. It's not what we say. It's what we actually live. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Interesting. What, what's it like? What was Zig Ziglar like? Cause I I've been inspired by his videos and stuff too. And he seems like the most charismatic, cool guy. Um, yeah. What was he? Well, like? yeah. Hey, charisma is not what somebody has. It's what you perceive they have when they are communicating in a way that you feel your values are being filled. Okay. And he definitely did that. He was a, a Southern Baptist, Dallas, Texas, religious, a Christian meets uh, educator and salesperson. And he was uh, on fire. He was a very inspired guy. And uh, yeah, he, he, when you were around him, you, you made you think and it made you want to act. So he was very great at, at what he did. And I, I, I met him when I was 20, and I, I think all the way into my 30s, I was interacting with him. And I was at the National Speakers Association and saw him speak a number of times, too. So 
Yeah, he had an impact on me and him and uh, Brian Tracy and, oh. and many other great people in the time. Um, I, I've been blessed. Jim Rohn, I had an impact. Jim Rohn had me um, make sure I always carried money wherever I went. And mm -hmm. uh, because he said, don't ever come to my seminar without at least $200 in your pocket because you won't be able to buy my product. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, wherever I went, I always had a minimum of, you know, a few hundred dollars in my pocket. And I, then I started to say, you know, I want to carry in my pocket what I want to make in a day. And I started carrying up to $30,000 in my pocket. Just to make, <laughs> and I achieved it. I got to make $30,000 a day on Amazon. So wow. it was, uh, it was, it was a little tool that uh, I can say thank you to Jim on, but, but all those guys had, they all had something that influenced me. <laughs> yeah. Amazing bunch. Yeah. That's really, really cool. And um, talking about your institutes, you also have a headquarters or in Johannesburg or I think Johannesburg or in South Africa now. Um, and you do a lot of business in South Africa, but also a lot of charity work too. Why South Africa? Well, uh, when I first came to South Africa, there was a gentleman um, that brought me there to the medical school. His name was Bruce Hoffman. He was a medical doctor, integrative medicine specialist. He lived in Calgary, Canada. Hmm. And I was lecturing in Calgary and he said, look, I'd like to bring it to the medical school down and show him your method because it's making a difference in health here. In fact, in London, uh, now the, the Royal College of Physicians honors the method as a healing modality now that, that's now being used as a, as a method now. Wow. But I went down there to lecture, and then I ended up doing the breakthrough experience there that same weekend. Um, and then there was a lady there that attended that and flew all the way to Australia because I was leaving for Australia right after my breakthrough. breakthrough. And she said, I'm going to follow you there. And, and she came to a seven-day program, the Prophecy One experience. And at the at that program, she said, "If I if I um, bring you if I bring you back to South Africa, will you keep coming? If I if I get people there for you?" And I said, well, "If you get enough people and pay my fees, then great." <laughs> um, and she did. And then we ended up kind of partnering there. And then she, you know, has an office there at the Pivot in Johannesburg, hmm. um, near Monte Cassino. Uh, and we've been there, I guess, fifteen plus years now, about fifteen years. And um, yeah, she's done a great job. Her name is Clarissa, and she's she's uh, done a lot there. We have a Houston office, which is original headquarters, and we also have an office in Johannesburg, which does a, quite a bit of the work we do around the world today. They're doing a lot of the, the technology and the internet work and all the social media and everything else there. Awesome. That's cool. Wow. And and any particular reason to, for doing some like charity work in South Africa as well? Well, it's not because I'm necessarily this charitable guy, um, but... It really started with being able to speak to youth because, you know, Paul Bragg came and did a talk that impacted my life. And so it, when I, I got teenagers in front of me, that's extra special. It's mm -hmm. like I get to do what I said to do. I would want to do that day. So I've done a lot for the, for, you know, classes and education for schools in South Africa. We got a big project coming up right now with a lovely lady, Tony Luck. That's uh, I think she's got 50,000 kids that we're going to be doing something for I'm not sure the details of it, but that's in motion. But we've done things for the Board of Education there to help help inspire kids. And we did Young Adults Inspire Destiny program. I did things in prisons there. We did things for the municipalities. There's various projects that come along as I go. Whenever I have availability and the time and everything else, I I, I grab it. I mean, it's, it's, it's meaningful to me and it's meaningful to them. And we both went out of it. So I, uh, I can't say I'm the you know, I'm exactly a philanthropist only by any means, mm -hmm. but I do, you know, philanthropy work in that way. I mainly bring it with education. That's my main form of philanthropy is educating people. That's the biggest. I do money things too, but mostly it's education. I, I figure that feed them for a fish, you give them a fish for the day and you feed them for a day, teach them how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. And I'm more in line to educate and, and share education. That's the greatest thing I've seen to help inequalities of any form in society is education. So I'm involved in that. Yeah. We, we couldn't agree more with you there. And, and it's great that you, that you do that work and Hey, you came to the university of Johannesburg for free and, uh, and, and inspired a bunch of students back in the day. So, you know, I've seen it firsthand that your kindness with that. So that that's great. Um, and you know, you've spoken so many places, you've actually also been on Larry King and Oprah and a, a number of other things like uh, these must be really quite interesting experiences going, you know, speaking to big productions like that. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've done the biggest thing I've done uh, recently was 250 million people out of Russia and, and it goes to 180 countries. Hmm. 
and it's and it's all the Russian people diaspora around the world that listen to it. I, I, was, I didn't even know that it existed, but they contacted me. And it's interesting. I was in Florida and they flew a crew from uh, Moscow. They had a, a, a producer in Moscow and a director in, in Los Angeles. And they're all on some sort of a Skype or something. And they're all monitoring the whole thing from Florida. Hmm. It's amazing what technology does. They normally have this massive team. And it was all done very efficiently. And, um, but it was a document, not exactly a document, but part of a documentary that was an hour long that is a thing about what I'm doing in the world. And so that's those type of things. And Larry King reaches about 99 million people. These shows help me reach uh, more people. And I just did a CNN one for about 20 million the other day. So I, I get the opportunities to reach people on larger scales by these, these mediums. And, um, so I just, I do everything I can. I do podcasts, I do presentations, uh, one-on-ones. I, I like them all. One-on-ones, I get real cases that I get to use for my teaching, teaching, inspiring people in, in large audiences I love. But, and I, I love doing workshops to help people transform their lives. And I also love doing media. So I do whatever, whatever the day brings, I do it. <laughs> You're a very inspiring man. And yeah, we're very <laughs> thankful for you. So what, one of the things like, um, which you, you have some, some opinions on is like people could potentially see you as like a guru, but you aren't like necessarily a fan of, of people being put on a pedestal. Um, why is that? Well, you know, I mean, I, I guess I'm a teacher. I'm a, I'm a human being. I, I, I work and to read and learn as much as I can. I like sharing that. And I, I don't like to be called a guru because I think that has a connotation that, that I think is misleading, but it really means, uh, you know, teacher, I guess, but I, I, I don't want people to put me on pedestals because then they're going to minimize themselves doing it. I don't want them putting me in pits because that's the compensation when they discover I'm not worth putting on pedestals. Hmm. I'm just worth putting in hearts. I, I feel like I'm a guy. I exemplify doing what I love doing. I'm inspired by it. Um, there's no reason why another human being can't live their life that way. I hope to exemplify that and teach them ways they can do that so they can make their vocation their vacation. So their life is doing what they love. Hmm. Some people are interested in that. Some people are not. Some people don't even believe that's possible. But um, I, I figure that uh, Albert Einstein said that greatest teacher is exemplification. So I better exemplify mastering all areas of my life. And I feel like I'm doing that and I, I feel grateful for that. But I don't like being put on pedestals because it's, it puts a false facade up that you then have to, you, you know, you can't live by. Mm. You know, people, people come up to me sometimes and say ridiculous things. Uh, I, I had a guy come up to me and said, I heard you raise the dead with your hands. <laughs> I, said, I did? I didn't know about that. He says, yeah, I heard you had a, a boy that was dead and you, you put your hands on him and you came back to life. And I go, no, I had a boy who had a coma. And before I did an adjustment on him, I said to myself, uh, unless I'm willing to let them die in my hands, I won't be able to raise the dead in the, with my hands as a metaphor that I have to overcome my courage enough to help this boy. Because I, I was I was concerned that he might die in my hands too. And and if you can't have him die in your hands, don't expect to help him come out of their coma. And he came out of a coma right in my hands, which was amazing. And so, yeah, that story got twisted and people twist things and get, you know, make it into something that they fantasize about. And then they, they create false ideas about you. And then you got to go and debunk those. And uh, I have that quite often, but I I'm just a guy who loves learning, who reads, writes, travels, and teaches. That's it. And I love doing it. <laughs> so cool. That is great. Yeah. So, so a lot of people obviously know you from the, the TV show, the secrets um, and with, and your work with uh, law of the, of attraction. And a good friend of ours, Gareth Pickering, who's actually on our show before, um, is working with Law of Attraction I himself. Uh, he was actually wanting to hear your thoughts on what you'd say to a person that's working with the Law of Attraction. They know what they want. Uh, they know what they're doing sort of all the right things in their mind. But for some reason, they're just not getting the perfect partner or the house or whatever. What kind of thoughts would you say to them? Well, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be facetious first. I had a lady come up to me, well, actually probably a hundred people come up to me after The Secret came out, which I think some people were very mis, misinterpreting and misled by. They came up to me and said, Dr. Martini, I watched the movie 20 times. I've read the book six times. 
um, I go out to my, my mailbox and for some reason I still don't get a million dollar check in it. And, and I go, have you considered working and serving? <laughs> you know, get real person. I mean, uh, you know, the reason I'm financially independent is because I got a small butt. I've worked my ass off and I've, and I've served people. And, and if you serve people, you, you can earn something. If you save a portion of it and invest it, you can, you can get ahead. But people have some, some sometimes delusions that they think they want to do that don't really match congruently what they actually want to do. And that's why a person needs to know their values. That's why I tell people to go on my website. There's a complimentary value determination process on there and take advantage of it. Because if you don't know what you're really valuing and you set a goal that doesn't match what's truly high on your values, you'll self-defeat and you'll end up self-depreciating. And that is a normal, healthy, biological response for pursuing things that aren't truly meaningful to you, to let you know what is meaningful, to feedback. And people have fantasies. I mean, I ask people, how many want to be financially independent? All the hands go up. How many of you are? 99% of the hands go down. And I said, how many of you have ever beat yourself up and felt self-depreciated about your money management? And they go, all the, all the hands up. I said, that's because you fantasize about being the lifestyle, the rich and famous, but you don't actually have a desire in your value system to save, invest in assets that produce return on investment in income passively. And you're wanting to quickly get an immediate gratification buying consumables that depreciate. And you're wanting a lifestyle, the rich and famous, instead of the wealth that leads to that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people live in a fantasy and they, and they many times set after goals that aren't really truly important to them. And I, I get it every week in the breakthrough experience, people come in with goals that aren't really true. They're delusions and fantasies that they expect and they beat themselves up going, why am I sabotaging? Why am I, you know, not focused? Why can't I continue to do this? What's wrong with me? Nothing. You're being led to what is important to you, but you fantasize about what it is. And it's not really what it is. Your life is demonstrating what it is. And you keep trying to force it into something it's not. And they kind of go, whoa, it's a wake up call to them. I had a lady that said, no matter what I do, I can't seem to start my business. Well, that's because your highest value is your children. And you got kids under the age of 10. And there are four of them. And you're sitting there working with them and being with them all day long. And of course, you're not going to start a business. Your highest value is children at this stage of your life. Hmm. When they get older and they go off to college, maybe you'll then start a business. But right now, fantasizing about a business because your friend has a business and beating yourself up thinking I should be like them is self-depreciating. The truth is you're a mother and you love mothering. And she cried and she goes, that's all I've ever wanted to do. Then give yourself permission to be you. Hmm. you know, don't try to be second at being somebody else. Be first to being you. Hmm. And people got to know what it is. And the secret behind the secret left out of the secret was the key called congruency. Hmm. If you're setting a goal and you're, you, you see it in your mind's eye, you think about it, you visualize it, you talk about it, you do things about it, you actually end up having, pardon me a second. Got to answer the phone and cut it down again. <laughs> um, but if you visualize it and think about it and firm it and focus on it and do the, the principles of the secret and it's congruent, you'll see opportunities, you'll take advantage of opportunities, you'll make it happen. But if it's not really important to you, you'll undermine it because you're trying to be somebody you're not. Yeah. Wow. So valuable. So valuable. Definitely. And do you have any thoughts on purpose versus passion? Well, passion, if you look at the etymology comes from pati and pasio, which means to suffer. And most people today are running around saying, Oh, find your passion, get no passion. Oh, I want more passion, everything else. They don't even know that that word means to suffer. <laughs> It comes from an animal behavior from the id of Freud that's basically meaning it's to strive for that which is unavailable and try to avoid that which is unavoidable and to try to do something that's an impulse and an instinct that's not really meaningful. And so if you want passion, I, I tell people, if you want to go passion or have compassion, which means to suffer with somebody, great. I'm not interested in that. I have no interest in passion or compassion. I'm interested in a mission, an inspired mission that's a calling from within that's based on your highest value that spontaneously is inspired from within. If you need motivation on the outside to get you to do what you say is important, it ain't important. I don't need motivation. I don't ever need a motivational speech to get me motivated to research, write, travel, teach. I love doing it. I do it spontaneously. It's innate. Finding that out, that's the key. And that's inspired and it's different than passion. Passion is striving for a one-sided outcome, a pleasure without a pain. It's a hedonistic pursuit. 
And the, the seven deadly sins of Christianity were the, the passions, which is gluttony for food, uh, sloth for work, you know, lust for relationships, greed for money, all the seven areas of life that were one-sided without fair exchange are all the passions. So the passion by definition needs to suffer, and I don't, I don't promote that. I let people know that it takes no effort, no training to be passionate. It takes effort to find meaning and to do something that's inspired, that's a mission that you would love to dedicate your life to that makes a difference and serves people that makes that difference. Awesome. Sounds so simple. <laughs> <laughs> and and how, do you, how do you find drive and motivation in, in your life? And how does someone else, it's, is it about finding your own value? When and, you're living by your highest value, you spontaneously are inspired from within. You don't need motivation. I don't need motivation. Mm -hmm. I would need motivation cooking. I haven't cooked since I was 24. I haven't driven in 29 and a half years. I delegate everything off my plate except research, write, travel, teach. I don't do anything else. I just delegate it all the way. And that way I'm not distracted by the things that devalue you. Anytime you're doing things low on your values, you devalue yourself. Anytime you're just sticking to the highest values, you value yourself. You want to be able to look in the mirror and say, hey, thank you. I love you. Stick to high priority things and you'll be able to do that without any problem. But if you constantly are weighing yourself down with low priority stuff and distractions, you're, you're, you're self-depreciating. If you don't fill your day with high priority actions and inspire you, your day fills up with low priority distractions that don't. And when you do, you're unfulfilled. And when you're unfulfilled, now you're wanting to escape it. And that's the passion. The passion is the escape that's looking for immediate gratification that goes into consumerism and our addiction to compensate for an unfulfilled and unmeaningful life. Hmm. And how do we dream big then without being unreasonable? Well, there's no size is not what makes reasonable. It's the size broken down into strategy, broken down into small bites. If you can go and see something that's massive, but you can break it down and bring it down into small bites that you can act on every single day and every day you're working towards it, that strategy is real. You can, you can do massive things, but the key is to making sure it's actually broken down and it's got some sort of tangibility. So you have some actions you can take that get you there. You know, I had a dream of traveling the world and go to every country in the world. Okay. I'm not there yet. I've still got some country skill. I have done 150 of them, but I started out at 17 with that goal. Okay, I'm 65 almost. I'm almost I'm two thirds of the way there, but that's great. I'm, I'm on it. But I chunked it down and I did it in steps. Same thing for reading, the same thing for speaking. I keep metrics on it and I make sure that I, I work on it. I had a goal to reach a certain number of people. We, I keep metrics of radio, television, newspapers, podcasts, everything to see if I'm reaching it and remodel what my goal is to do it. So if I break down big projects into small bites and do little baby steps, I make big dreams. How, how do you keep track of everything? Like you, you mentioned early on, like you have like these small notes when you read, um, but, but you, you've just consumed such a vast amount of information and everything. How do you keep track? Is it digital? Is it physical? It, it used to be on index cards. Every time I get an idea, I'd put it on index cards. I sort it. I used to have a whole room and nothing but index cards, about uh, 360,000 uh, cards of, of information. But wow. What happened is I then went out on the computer and I had a person who was 19 years old that typed 80 to 100 words a minute and she typed some of that all into a computer and I have now all that on computer and now I know exactly where all that information is here. So I know where to go to get what information, I know where to put it. So if you don't have organized knowledge, you don't have power. You have to organize the knowledge as you, as you glean it. So if I'm reading something or learning something or listening to something, I'll make sure that I either type it right away or put it in some sort of index card and store it away. That way I don't lose the information. And uh, I, I know where things are. I, I have it sorted in my mind. Every There's not one thing that I could learn that doesn't have a place on my computer. Hmm. I think it's so valuable. It's like it's putting systems in place to retain knowledge is, uh, is, is actually so vital because how many times in a day you've thought something and then it's gone and then you probably never get it back. And if that happens over a lifetime, just think of the loss of knowledge. Well, that's, that's sort of what I looked at in, in my life. I used the index card. They were fa fabulous back until the computer came out in the 80s. And uh, then I started using a computer. Now they have sorting systems. So I can just type stuff now. Now I can speed read a book, put symbols on the side of the pages. I can have somebody, I can hand it to a person. They can type everything that I underline. All the symbols will sort and they'll go into the thing and then they'll send that to me and I'll sort it back into my files. And I'll, have, I'll know where everything is that way. So it's, it's, I got it down to a pretty good science.
because it's my responsibility to learn. I mean, that's what I did. And then you'll teach it like half an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to teach it as soon as possible. Almost every time, all my programs uh, have certain standards of information. And then there's always new information that, that I'm bringing in of what's most recently refer, you know, referenced and studied. And I bring it in just so I can retain it. That's part of the, the inspiration component because I'm inspired by it. People get inspired by it. It's also helping me retain the information. I also learned, I learned when I was studying dentistry, I did two things. I had a, I was studying cancer and oncology and I was studying dentistry and I was studying chiropractic at the same time. And uh, it was interesting was when I was doing dentistry, I was devouring books on it, everything I could get in Houston. And then I was lecturing to a Tri-County Dental Association conference. And out of it, out, a, a guy asked me a question. I had no idea I knew the answer, but it just came pouring out of me. And I realized I had a photographic image of the information out of a book when they asked. I didn't know I had the information. So that's when I realized that just go ahead and put it in visually and not but limit your, what you've learned to your conscious knowledge. If you only learn by what you, you consciously know, you're gonna blow out a whole lot of information and slow down your learning. Your unconscious has a vast amount of information that when you need it and when it's purposeful will surface out of your unconscious and come right forward as you need it. Hmm. That was really valuable to me to, to get that in dentistry because then I just allow the information to go in and I know when I need it, it's there. <laughs> so, so I'm sure you go, you have people go, uh, but uh, Dr. Demartini, you have like a photographic memory and you just, you know, you're lucky you're one of those people. What do you say to people that say that to you? Uh, you didn't know me when I was younger. <laughs> uh, you know, people come up to you and say, oh, you're gifted. I said, really? Why don't you try, um, let's see, the breakthrough experience I've done 1,065 or so times. It's 26 hours each. That's 28,000 hours I put into one program. That's mm -hmm. not even all the research behind it. That's just the delivering of it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you put 28,000 hours into something, I'm sure I'll put 30,000 hours into the next couple of years. Okay, you're going to get proficient at it after a while. So you learn something and people think it's a gift. No, it's not. It's work and, and it's effort. Like Michelangelo, when they asked him, you know, how did you do this? This is amazing. You're a genius. He goes, you have no idea how many hours I put into this thing. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't like to call people gifted. I like to call people hardworking. <laughs> there, there was a little boy that I saw in a, a video called Genius the other day. He started doing the piano at a year and a half old. At two and a half, he was already doing amazing stuff on it. Uh, and he was listening 20 hours a day almost to music. His father was making him listen to piano music 20 hours a day. <laughs> so then when all of a sudden he's doing concert piano at seven and traveling around the do during concert piano performances, they think, oh, he's gifted. He's a child prodigy. Well, not when you put in the hours the kid put in, when he's at his peak of his learning and when he's a little baby. <laughs> and this kid was learning the piano and could play the piano, any piece on the piano, because he's heard it <laughs> numerous times, the best and the greatest classical pieces of music that's ever been written. <laughs> so if we feed our minds full of great information, we get things out of our mind. Powerful. I think Mozart, Mozart had a similar story, I think, just hours yeah. and hours and hours. And everyone thought he, meanwhile, it was just literally his dad was a, a real taskmaster <laughs> and made oh, him. I, I, I was the taskmaster because whatever they asked me to do in school, I always 10 times did minimum. Mm. And I want to know it because I want to know it. I didn't want to pass. I didn't give a crap about a test. The test meant nothing to me because mm. a test to me were like minuscule, insignificant, uh, almost um, insult. I, I remember I went into a neurology class in Dr. Nash's class. And uh, he gave us like, I think, 50 questions. You get two points each. And it had A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or whatever. You know what I mean? A, if it's this, B, if it's this, E, if it's this and this kind of thing. And so I, I read more books on neurology than anybody in the class. And I went in there and I said, B, according to so-and-so, uh, <laughs> is, is obsolete, outdated, cross out. B, um, this and this person, according to so-and-so. Uh, I put in G and H. Uh, <laughs> this is, you know, and I redid the test and I sent it back to the guy and he failed me. What? Dr. Nash failed me in the class and he said, he, I, I came to him and I brought 49 books on neurology with little pieces of paper on the pages for reference. And I came up to him with a box of these books, 49, two boxes, 49 books. And I came into his office 
And I said, you failed me. And he said, of course I failed. You can't answer a test like that. I said, well, I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to dare you because you don't have the power to tell me what I can't do in my class. And he's like, who are you? I mean, what, what is this? And I said, here's my references. Get your my test out. I'm going to put my reference. And I'm going to challenge you because you're just a guy that's read one textbook. I know neurology apparently more than you did. And I challenged him. And he looked at that. He said, I thought you were joking. These are serious answers. I said, yeah, here's my references. Wow. He sat there. He goes, I had no friggin' idea this is what you were doing. <laughs> I thought you were playing games with me. I said, no, I came here to learn neurology. I didn't come here to play games. And these references are solid. And you don't have a right to tell me I don't pass the test. <laughs> he gave me, he said, you've, you're placed out of my class. And then about three weeks later, he got busted for having uh, sex with one of the teachers, the students. Wow. And he was got suspended and he called me and he says, can you teach my class? <laughs> <laughs> I got to teach the class. Uh, no ways. I did that in neurology, embryology, pathology. I did it in different <laughs> classes. And I thought I'd rather know more than the class. So when I take the class, it's just in review. But I, I, I just, I didn't do it for test. I did it because I wanted to know the information because I was thinking I have real patients I'm going to be serving and I need that information to serve people with. And Dr. Demartini, is there something that you've dreamed of doing for a long time that you haven't? Well, I still haven't gone to every country, so I'm still working on new countries every year. I want to do it organically. I live on a ship called The World that travels around the world. That gives me an opportunity to go to those countries, but I still want to speak there. So that when I was in Antarctica, I, I got to speak on the ship in Antarctica to the residents and to huh. some guests. But I also went out... <laughs> in a little bitty boat, a little uh, a Zodiac, wow. rubber kind of raft thing. I went up to the shore. There were about 5 million penguins, as far as you could see. And I did a black tie presentation um, and spoke to all the penguins. I got a picture taken so I could at <laughs> least acknowledge that I spoke uh, to, to the <laughs> residents of Antarctica. <laughs> That's <laughs> so cool. That's so cool. And, and maybe can you tell us a little bit about this ship? It sounds fascinating. And then also, is there any favorite destinations? I know it's almost impossible to, to pick one to be in so you many know, places. I, I, I don't really care where I go. I just love traveling. Um, they're all great. As far as I'm, there's every city I've been in, there's something unique. I mean, some are maybe a little flat, but most of them are inspiring and countries are, you get to meet people in different cultures and, so the, the ship is just the best address I've been able to find for what I want in life. It, it just circumnavigates the world. It goes to every major place, wherever there's a port, anywhere, whether it goes up a river or whether it's in the sea or an ocean, it doesn't matter. It goes from the Arctic to the Antarctic and goes everywhere. And uh, it's just the best address I've been able to find for what I do. I'm not on there that often. I'm, I'm mainly traveling and speaking and I'm in hotels most of the time. And I love that too. People say, how can you live in a hotel? Really easy. I push a button, they take my clothes, they give me my food, they clean my place, and I get to work. So it's, it's quite easy. And people go, well, you're very peculiar. And I go, great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Um, but, but like, how do, you, how do you stay healthy? Like, you know, because I mean, eating hotel food and whatever, I'm sure maybe, how do you do that? I don't know. I, I mean, I had a plain yogurt this morning, a beautiful Concord grapes, because they know me here, and they'll get me some grapes. Uh, and some multi-grain bread. And I had some uh, quinoa and black uh, brown rice and avocado and a bit of fish and uh, some carrots and some vegetables at lunch today. Um, I have no problem getting food wherever I go. I've not had any problem getting decent food as I travel. Cool. That's awesome. That's when I'm on the ship, I, get, I got fresh juices and greens and they'll mm. make you anything you want there. So oh, that's and, nice. uh, usually when I'm in cities, I know where there's little places and nooks to get uh, fresh vegetable juices and things of this nature and natural food. So I'm pretty good. I think, I don't think there's a, a problem there. Yeah. yeah, Cool. And just uh, one of the things that you talk a fair amount about is wealth. Uh, what is a good first step towards creating personal wealth? Well, you're not going to create financial wealth. Everybody's got wealth. It's the wealth of their children, the wealth of their knowledge, the wealth of these things, but financial wealth will require that you have a high value on wealth building financial wealth building because money circulates through the economy from those who value at least to those who value it most. And if you don't value money and if you don't value serving people and you don't value uh, building wealth, it's not going to happen. You got, if you have a value on buying things more so than putting money into assets, you're not going to get ahead financially. So first you have to have a value on it. And I tell people that uh, if you don't have a high enough value on wealth, it's going to go to somebody else's hands. 
The second thing is to make sure that you conservatively invest it. And many people want immediate gratification. They want a quick fix on a getting rich overnight. And I watch people, you know, rise and fall and fall back and start over again doing that. And I'm this, uh, the old tortoise in the hare. I'm the tortoise. I just kept saving and investing and saving and investing and saving and investing for 36 years, going on the 37 years now. And I've gotten financially independent. Financial independent to me means uh, living how you want to live with absolute never having to work a day in your life, even though you love working. I love working. I don't have to. I, I could live on my ship for 100 years and live on a couple million dollars a year and do nothing. And, uh, but that would be boring. I, I'd like, what, I wouldn't be using my talents. I would rather do what I love doing and do what is inspiring to me and, and uh, do that for a living and get paid for it. And then have a cause for building more wealth that I want to do something with, that legacy that I want to build with it. <laughs> Super power. That's really fascinating. But, but, you know, talking about business here, um, just a little bit, um, you mentioned motivation earlier, but what helps your staff and yourself be engaged? Well, if, if you hire, nobody goes to work for the sake of a company. They go to work to fulfill what they value most. If they can't see how the job duties they take are helping them get what they want, they're not going to be engaged. But if they can see how it's going to help them get what they want, they're very engaged. So when you hire somebody, you want to know what their highest values are, and you want to be able to ask them a question. Here's the job description. Here's the job response, please. How is doing each of these going to help you fulfill what's most important to you? If they can't answer that fluently, congruently, don't hire them, because they're not going to be able to be engaged. You're going to have to micromanage them and distract, and you won't be able to go on and delegate and get on with your mission. You'll be uh, micromanaging and having to push them uphill. But if you get somebody that's engaged, you're freed. Boom, you take care of it. I don't even know half the stuff that goes on. I don't even have a desire to know some of the stuff. It's their specialty. They do it. My job is do what I do. Their job is do what they do and let them go do it. I, I, I stay out of their hair. But, but do you still hire them or do you get... I haven't hired somebody in 30 years. I've had, I've had people that do that for me. Okay. And have you ever had, like, have you had to fire people though? Not really. I, I had somebody else to take care of that. Uh, okay. I, I research, write, travel, teach since I was 30. <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. Mary, Mary Kay, I, I lectured to Mary Kay at Mary Kay Cosmetics when I was 30 years old. And she, she, I went up to her and I asked her, what, do you, what advice could you give me? And she said, every day, write down the six or seven highest priority action steps you can do today that can help you fulfill your dreams. So I started doing that on index card. And then what I did is I accumulated those cards and looked at what was common to all the things that were highest priority for the day. And it came up, research, write, travel, teach. So then I delegated everything off, off my plate. And then I made a list of everything I was doing in a day. I, I looked at what it produced per hour. What was the meaning percentage it had? What uh, cost would it take to delegate that item? And how much time was spent? And then I went and prioritized it. And layer by layer by layer, I delegated everything except research, write, travel, teach. So I don't do anything else. I'm useless. <laughs> I think uh, I'll challenge that uh, that last word you said there. <laughs> I, I, I jokingly, I jokingly say, even with my girlfriend, I I, I delegate lovemaking to specialists. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if I got you Hugh Jackman today, would you still love me? And she goes, Yes, I'd love you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. Uh, so, so the greatest amount of growth happens at the border of support and challenge. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so let's say that um, somebody comes up to you and gives you what you want, when you want, every time you want, and makes it easy on you, and you don't have any responsibilities it, it, that, that in your life. You know, you're like a child that's spoiled. Uh, it's not going to grow. It's going to be juvenile dependent and not going to be precociously independent. It's the child that's challenged that grows. And you give them accountabilities, responsibilities, etc. I was blessed. When I, when I was nine years old, my dad... Uh, you know, I went to him to ask if I could, uh, you know, earn some money because I want to buy a baseball and a glove and some bat. And he said, well, did you mow the yard? Uh, yeah. Did you edge the sidewalk? Yeah. Did you do the hedges? Yeah. Did you clean the garage? Yeah. Did you clean your room? Yeah. Did you uh, cl clip, uh, I mean, uh, clear out the gutters? Yeah. And he made a list of all the things around the house I could do, and they're all done. He said, well, if you, I don't have anything else that needs to be done, and I'm not going to pay you for doing something I don't need. If you want to earn money, go to the neighbor's. So I started going to the neighbors and started earning money with the neighbors using the equipment in the garage. And um, I, I bought baseball glove and bat and stuff. My dad saw that. He goes, where'd you get the stuff that you bought? 
And I said, well, I did neighbor work. And he goes, what equipment did you use? And I said, well, in the garage. He said, well, I got to teach you about depreciation schedules. So he started charging me, back charging me for all the work I'd done. I, oh, man, I owe money now. And then um, for gasoline and everything. And I said, well, okay. And then I was doing yards, and I was saving a portion, paying off my dad, paying off. I eventually got nine kids working for me to do all the work, and I was selling the deals and then, uh, you know, making profits and then giving my dad his portion and, and this. And buying it, I would make probably an equivalent of about $800 a day back in 1963. <laughs> and my dad saw that, and he was, he was kind of thinking, well, wow, you're resourceful. But he said, but you're not saving your money. You're buying stuff. You got to learn to save your money and invest it. So he bought me a coin collection set in a piggy bank. And believe it or not, that piggy bank is sitting in my drawer in my office on the 52nd floor of, in Houston, Texas, in Williams Tower. It sits there just to the right. It has never been opened since 1963. The original coins that I stuck in there that summer is in that piggy bank. I've never opened it as a metaphor to think long term. Wow. That's, That's incredible. 50, 50 years ago, <laughs> or almost 50, well, almost, no, whatever, 63. That's 55 years ago. And what's interesting is um, that metaphor got me into thinking later in, in about saving and investing. But my dad then said, you know, now that you've learned to uh, save and invest and make money and do that, he wanted me to be an entrepreneur because he knew I couldn't do it in school. I was never going to go finish school. And he said, he says, I'm now going to start charging you for clothing, room, and rent and food. Hmm. And he charged me $7.50 a week to live there. So I had to pay, you know, 30 bucks, a dollar a day to live at my house at that time. And you were how old? I was nine. Nine? <laughs> I, I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm very grateful. I'm very yeah. grateful for that because that was probably the best thing my dad could ever do for me wow. to make me accountable. Now, I left home not because I was angry with my dad. I, I love my parents. It's just I just wanted to meet that girl. And that was a high value when you're 13, you know. You know your, your testosterone's kicking in. And, uh, but I, I said, okay, I'm going to be independent. My dad said, I've taught you everything you need to know by age seven, and you're going to be independent. You're going to be a little, you know, street smart kid. Okay. I did live on the streets, and I was street smart. I had a few close uh, calls a few times. But I wouldn't pay, trade that for any education. That was a very powerful education for me. Wow. And that street smarts uh, is uh, stands you in good stead when you're in Johannesburg. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. There's lots of it there. And, and uh, But I, I, I don't have compassion for the people. I know that sounds odd because that means I'm suffering with them because I'm wounded from my own past. See, mm -hmm. what happens is if you're wounded from your past, and you were hurt, and then you see somebody that's going through what you went, you go, oh, I was hurt, you must be hurt, and then, oh, I wanna help you. I see that whatever they're going through, I come from a different perspective, and I try to inspire them and say, this is a strategy, there's all kind of other strategies, let's use the most efficient. And I don't sit there and go, oh, you poor thing. I go, hey, you have a capacity to do something extraordinary with your life. Let's go figure out how to do it. <laughs> Amazing. So, we're almost coming to the end here and I just wanted to ask a question um, about love. So is there a, such a thing as unconditional love? Absolutely. There's every weekend in the breakthrough experience, uh, a person who does the Demartini method to completion has a moment of unconditional love where they don't look up, they don't look down, they look across, their heart is open, they got tears in their eyes, there's true gratitude for the person. Now, no one stays there. You then go on to the next illusion in your life and the next thing you're going to work on and the next uh, button that pushes uh, your, your buttons or whatever. But you can definitely have a moment of unconditional love. And I, I, I am absolutely certain about that. So yeah, in the breakthrough experience, I show people how to take anything that's ever happened in their life, no matter what it is, I don't care what it is, and to have you absolutely have love for it. There's nothing your mortal body can experience that your mortal soul can't love. And your mortal soul is the state of unconditional love. It's the state of perfect equanimity and poised perceptions of life. And that's something that is reproducible and duplicatable and transferable and translatable. And it's, and it's a science of the Demartini method to do that. And you can, but nobody's going to stay there. I don't stay there. I have moments of it. And then I go on to my next illusion in life. <laughs> and, um, wow, you're such an inspiring guy. Seriously. Like, thanks so much for this chat. Um, I guess, like, what, what do you have coming up uh, in the future? 
um, in terms of your seminars and conferences and, and any other like new work that you have? You mentioned you're writing a book. And how can people uh, get in touch with you? Well, there's lots of things going on. I mean, right now we're in the middle of uh, a project in Tokyo at the Keio University on uh, the method, the Demartini method, as it relates to grief. Um, we've done a pilot there. It's, it's quite a 100% uh, results so far on it. That's going to be published, it looks like, um, thanks to Professor Maino and Shogun. They're, they're there. I have um, an opportunity right now. They're, they're working at raising funds for a movie they want to do in my life. A gentleman out of Spain, uh, demartinimovie.com, I think, or yeah, demartinimovie.com, or yeah, demartinimovie.com, I think it's what it's called. And um, there's also, I've had five offers to do Netflix series, so those are kind of, kind of cool. I don't know who is going to end up being the one to do it. We have to wait till the movie's finished to do it, though. Uh, but that's kind of interesting. I've got a new book that's coming out that's going to be on the, the sun, on the relationship between the evolution of consciousness to the sun. Uh, and life in the cosmos, you might say. And then um, I've also got another book that's going to be starting in, in October on the grief, the, my method on grief that's involved. And I, I'm getting new opportunities. We're breaking grounds in different countries with speaking opportunities that I'm blessed to be a part of. And I'm just researching and trying to learn and do what I can. I've had the opportunity to meet so many amazing people and work with so many amazing people that I, I, I can't complain. It's a great uh, life. I've been blessed. And um so yeah, I'm just keep working and doing what I love doing. That's amazing. Okay. And, We're gonna, and we, so, sorry. So, sorry, Craig, I just want to, um, what, what's like, you know, after you've written this book, what, what is the next thing you kind of want to research and you're interested in? Well, I'm, I'm finishing up this one book on the sun because that's a series of 10, uh, two volume sets. It's 20 volume series that I put together. Sure. Uh, but then I'll be working on, uh, I've got my long term. A 21 year correspondence course that I want to update. So I'm going to be updating that next. Um, and I'll, I'll put this book on that. And I'm going to put one, a book out on the Demartini method because I want people to know about that. I want that to be a part of a legacy. That's about to come online any day, any uh, week now. There'll be the method itself that's mm -hmm. actually going to be online so people can work on it on their apps and things. And um, no, I just, I, I'm going to be working on whatever. I, I won't stop learning and reading and writing. I mean, that's just what I love doing. I'll, okay. I'll, uh, I'll be doing that. And I do it. I'm doing podcasts and, and and anything that can do to can disseminate information um, and help me challenge myself to learn. I, I'm open to. That's what I do. Hmm. And as far as getting a hold of me, you can get a uh, hold of me on drdmartini.com. My website is just simply drdmartini.com. Drdmartini.com, and that has a vast amount of information. You could sit down and go into the media there and watch radio shows, TV shows, media, magazine, hundreds and hundreds. I mean, we've got thousands of magazines, thousands of magazine uh, articles in there. And then there's also YouTube channels and there's inspirational materials. Um, and you also the events where I'm around the world and the webinars we're doing and the online and there's all kinds of stuff there that can keep people busy learning. Yeah, we'll definitely link to all of that. There's a lot there, so really and great. The value determination. I want people to do the value determination because it will help their life. Great. Yeah. So we have another question. It's our last question for you, uh, John. And what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Well, you know, it depends on, on the context, obviously, but uh, ridiculously human means that could be either way. You could imagine it as being ridiculous and being, a, you know, somebody that's just not rational, or you could see it as somebody that's stepping out of the normal box of conformity and going out and doing something extraordinary on planet Earth. And people will call you ridiculous because you're way ahead of the curve. I mean, I'm sure that when Elon Musk was said, oh, we're going to go to Mars, we're going to build a spacecraft that goes up and comes back down, they thought that's ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe not so. Could you, I just saw a video today that came in on my space uh, re research center uh, that showed it going up and coming back down. Both pieces came down and landed perfectly. So I uh, here they, here's a guy that they thought was ridiculous that's – proving them uh, in the dark ages. So ridiculous could have two meanings. Yeah. I, I choose to see it uh, because of this, this podcast as being ridiculous enough to believe that you can do extraordinary things and giving yourself permission to do it. And then proving that through exemplification that that which you thought was ridiculous or the others thought was ridiculous became something that changed the world. <laughs> That's awesome stuff. So just, just to finish off, uh, seriously, I just want to say like, 
a massive thank you for for coming on the show um and for being such a normal guy like you know what i mean like you you just come across as just the the the, the nicest person and like you said there's no there's, there should be no levels and things like that but people always um assume things um and it's so nice it's so nice that you just you, you just talk and you you say like you know normal things and you, you just treat us like really like cool normal blokes so thank you so much for for doing that and you've really really inspired me uh, as a person like to to really take my learnings uh, another layer deeper and to and to just get uh, more like more traction in terms of what I actually do um, because yeah it's just been so inspiring listening to you I have I have a bookshelf of books here and probably 60 books that are unread because I don't know I just I, I just like consuming books um, but now I really want to go and learn how to speed read and, and how to you know retain that information and um, just share that too as well because uh, like yeah you just you just really inspired me to to actually be a well, better human I, I found many years ago that the wise thing to do is to prioritize your reading and I found that the highest priority reading for me was to go to the originators of each of the disciplines and ologies who actually founded them because they were original people that were stepping out of the box and giving themselves permission to create something original I wanted to surround myself with the people that were the most original so I have the most inspiration to create original ideas that serve humanity. So prioritize what you do if you're going to read and delegate things that aren't inspiring uh, or link them to what is inspiring. So you maximize the reading and use it to the greatest capacity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great. And then the last bit is like also just around like prioritizing what's important in your life, you know, and, and getting people to do things that, um, that you don't necessarily want to do. Um, so thank you so much for the lessons. Uh, thank you so much for the chat. I I'm inspired to, to do your breakthrough experience definitely. And I think you've got one coming up in London. Um, and if not, you mentioned the online one, so I'm definitely going to be doing that. So thanks. You. Thanks yeah, I'll be doing, I've got one in Los Angeles. I've got one in London. I've got one in Dublin. I've got one in Johannesburg. I've got one here in Sydney, one in Melbourne. We do them around the world, Denver, uh, Houston. Um, I just did them in New York and Toronto and Calgary, uh, and Tokyo. I, I, I do 43 a year breakthroughs somewhere in the world, but my website has the locations. Brilliant. And just real briefly from my side, John, listen, I can't echo strongly enough what Gareth said. It's just been absolutely inspiring. From the day I saw you in that lecture hall in Johannesburg to now, you've been an inspiration. And actually, what you'd mentioned earlier, I'd had your memory doesn't always serve you correctly. And and I'd I'd kind of had a different image of you. And it's it's actually refreshingly good now, even better than I, I remember because of what Gareth mentioned, just being such a straightforward person you look us in the eye and you say it as it is and people love that and 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 it's very engaging and and that's why like it, it inspires us to want to be more and do more so thank you for the time today keep doing what you're doing and we can't wait to to see what uh, you're up to in the future it will definitely be inspiring and interesting and uh, bigger than life as it seems like the sun <laughs> well thank you and, and i appreciate the opportunity to share with uh, new people and and um We'll break bread wherever we meet up yeah. and just come up and just say, hey, da, 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 because I won't always know everybody in the audience. And um, great. And if you want to do another uh, interview sometime, just let us know. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you Thank so you, much. John. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon in, uh, in Sydney. Thank you. Thank you all. Both of you. Thank right. you. Take care. Bye. See you later, man. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. Eh? Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change.